I think the beauty of BMX is it allows you to look at life differently. It's powerful, even though it's incredibly basic. It's a hobby, but it's uh, for one, I've I've met so many good people. But you kind of look at life differently. You kind of look at what you have in front of you, and you don't think about much more. If it becomes something that I feel like I kind of have to prove to someone else, then it just it turns it into something more than, you know, just a hobby to me. So when I'm just riding, I'm just cruising around. I just, I'm not looking to impress anybody by that. It's just freedom for me, really, is all it is. I'm trying to do my own thing. This is my cousin, Casey Smith. He's been riding BMX since he was 12. For years, I've been the biggest fan of Casey. I follow his Instagram religiously, which is almost entirely dedicated to BMX. He's a photographer and a documentarian. He's also a husband and a father of two. And he's in the Navy. I don't think a lot of people ride in the military because they have this perception that, you know, military is 24 hours a day. I'm not gonna be able to ride a bike. Why would I join the military? But no, it's not like that at all. Like, yeah, you'll have time to ride a bike. It's the military, but it's, it's a job. Casey rides with his best friend, Tyler. He and Tyler have been riding together for 18 years, and both are at similar places in their lives. They both live in Delavan, Wisconsin, a small town surrounded by cornfields, and both are married with full-time jobs and two kids. We're kind of brothers almost, you know? We've been you know, such close friends for so long that I, I honestly, we, we feel like brothers at this point, you know? Over the past few years, I just uh, I kind of fell in love with this brand. It's called Haro, Haro Bikes. I've always been really excited about them and try to support them as much as I can. And they help me out too, which is which is awesome. That's something else I've, I've kind of been proud of. I've been riding for 20 years. I've never been sponsored. And that, I think that's, that, that just shows my love for riding, at, you know, in its, in its most basic form. Casey rides a Blyther 85 FST made by Haro. This bike is super cool looking. It's a tribute to one of the OG BMXers, Brian Blyther. The frame is red, but it's more of a fire engine red. And it's so bright that it's hard to look away. How many bikes do you own, first of all? Maybe a dozen bikes. But like I said, I have one that's just for riding at like skate parks here. You could probably see mine looks a little different than everyone else's bright and it's like weird cursive letters, you know? Like, yeah. What is so different about this bike? It's like a reissue. It's, it mimics a bike they had in like 1985. Yeah. It, it has the same look, but okay. different dimensions and different geometry. A BMX bike doesn't really get any more simple than this. Like, I don't have brakes, I don't have pegs. So I like it to be really simple. I love that sound. It's so cool about it. Everyone does their own thing, and yeah. everyone kind of has their own style, and they do their own tricks. It's pretty cool. BMX is short for bicycle motocross. It started in the early 70s in Southern California when kids were riding empty swimming pools and concrete reservoirs. The earliest documentation being two brothers, Devin and Todd Bank, who built an eight foot ramp in their yard. They are noted for being the pioneers of a specific style of BMX, freestyle. And as you can imagine, there are lots and lots of tricks. All right, yeah, yeah. So I'll, t I'll take you through some of the names. Um, one's called a fufanu. You put your back tire on what's called the coping. It's like a metal pipe that's at the top of the ramp. You put your back tire on it, and then you kind of do a 180 and come in forward. One similar to that is called a, a bubica. And so you put your back tire on the coping again, except you come in backwards, what's called fakie. So when you're moving backwards, it's called fakey. Tabletop is where you kind of turn your bike on the side in the air. That's like the best trick in BMX. It's a trick that you'll do the entire time you ride BMX. You'll never, it will never get old. So like a tabletop is also known as a flatty in Australia. I think it's they call it a pancake. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see a bar spin, X up, ice pick, toothpick, nose pick, turn down, truck driver, bus driver, backflip sure you know when you leave the ramp and you come back in it's called an air uh, i think it was called an aerial 
back in the day, but they kind of just call it an air now. And uh, so when you look at the camera, it's called Ratitude. <laughs> it's something that it's something that was huge in the '80s. And uh, if you if you uh, look back at all the magazines in the '80s, a lot of dudes are doing Ratitude, but it's also called a look back. So it's it's something I don't know. '80s style is something that I just love. I mimic the writers of the '80s. And because it's just something I wish I, I could have experienced for myself, you know. Are there any writers that you look up to or are inspired by? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of them, especially guys from the 80s. Eddie Fiola is one of the guys. Um, he actually does, like, stunt work now. Uh, another guy, Brian Blyther, he's a, he's a cop now out in California. Yeah, I love watching those guys ride because they, they were the same as me, man. Like, they just love cruising and catching air, and that's it, having style, you know what I mean? That's, that's what I love doing. Casey's mom and my mom are sisters. Casey and I grew up in the kind of family where our moms talked on the phone at least once a day. Casey has a brother and sister, and I also have a brother and sister. A lot of times these phone conversations would consist of the daily happenings of us kids. And afterwards, our moms would deliberate with each of us what was going on with so-and-so. There was a period of time though, when I was in college, where I would only get bits and pieces of information. I remember at one point hearing something about Casey falling off his bike, something about his jaw being wired, and something about his little sister putting pizza in a blender and blending it for him. I had never actually known if this truly happened or if there were other incidents like it. So I asked him. I have a couple stories, I guess, a couple injury stories. I have two that are, I would consider my worst injuries. One is like no worse than the other. They were both extremely bad. So... I was about 18. I was riding a skate park in Burlington, Wisconsin. It was at night, and there were no lights, and we were just, we were like wrapping it up, you know what I mean? We were about to go, and uh, I was trying this trick. It's, it, it was on this, what they call a mini ramp. It's, it's basically a half pipe. Do you know what a half pipe is? Okay, I'll just explain it. Take a circle and cut it in half. That's basically the shape of a half pipe. This was like a scaled down version, so it was called a mini ramp. I think it was five feet tall. And I was trying a trick called a downside ice pick stall. It was a very Midwest trick. Like the, there's different tricks that come out of different areas. When I was growing up, BMX was extremely technical in the sense that you're doing a lot of tricks kind of linked together. You have different areas like, let's say, Pennsylvania, where they have a bunch of dirt jumps, trails. And they just, you know, that was big in, in that area. So, but I was trying this trick, downside ice pick stall, and my rear wheel kind of slipped out and I kind of landed disaster is what they call. Your front sprocket on your bike lands on the coping. And I wasn't really ready for that. So I, I kind of tried to jump off and I went straight to flat. I landed directly on my chin, chin straight down to flat, like from, you know, five feet straight to flat. I kind of sat up and I just knew instantly that something was wrong. My first instinct was to like, you know, bite down and feel your jaw and wiggle it. And when I bit down, my bottom teeth were just completely not lined up with my top teeth. It was the weirdest feeling ever. Ran to the hospital, you know, rushed to the hospital and got x-rays, all that stuff. The doctor said it wasn't broken. He said it was just uh, like bruised. I went home. I was sitting around for a while, just in pain. I, I wanted to eat because I was getting hungry so I got a banana and like that first bite was just like the worst pain ever like it was just like this grinding like oh my god it was it was disgusting like it it hurt so bad so I was like I screw this I gotta go back to the hospital so we went to a different hospital took more x-rays the doctor showed me the x-rays it was up by my left ear like the hinge and one bone was like (laughs) <laughs> you know, going in one direction and the other one was going in a complete opposite direction. And he's like, yeah, your, your jaw's completely broken. So the next day, I went in and got surgery and had it wired shut six weeks, like horrible. Eating through a straw for six weeks, like it was bad. My next one, this was about 2002. 10 and I was living in Virginia for some reason I've always just hit my face when I ride like my face has been like smashed so this time I was riding at a skate park called Mount Trashmore it was in Virginia Beach I was going up on this ramp 
The ramp was about seven or eight feet tall. The thing about the ramp, it was really tight. Like the transition was tight. Like every ramp is different. Some are really steep and some are mellow, but this one just happened to be really steep and really tight. So I was trying a trick called a foot jam. You stick your foot in the front tire on top of the ramp and kind of balance yourself on the front tire and then you come back in. But I hadn't really ever ridden that ramp before. I kind of waited too long and my bike was coming in and I still tried to jump off and my right foot got hooked onto the top tube of my frame, just dove straight to flat. Again, didn't break my fall, landed directly on my face. That time I got knocked out. I remember just this flash of like white. I still remember the, the feeling of hitting the concrete from that high up, it was, it was unbelievable. I sat up and the first thing I realized was I have no teeth. My nose is like completely broken. My chin is like gushing blood. And I just drove myself to the hospital, like probably had a concussion. Like, And sure enough, as you could expect, I got pulled over on the way to the hospital. <laughs> I got pulled over because my license plates were expired, but they weren't expired. I just hadn't put in stickers on them yet. And he comes up and he's like, oh my God, what happened? Are you all right? And I was like, yeah, 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 I just, I fell off my bike. And he's like, oh, wait. Uh, your uh, your license plates are expired. I'm like, no, they're not. Like, look at this piece of paper. I renewed them. I haven't gotten the stickers yet. All right, all right, all right. Just go, 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 go. <laughs> so I just rushed to the hospital, and that was bad. I probably went to the dentist 12 times. Four root canals, crowns. The feeling that I was saying earlier was my teeth grinding on the concrete. I could, if I think about it too much now, I can start to feel it, and it's disgusting. Oh, my God. Yeah, so at least four teeth are fake in front. But they look beautiful. I thought they did a pretty good job. It, it, it was it. It took a long time, but well, how's eating for you? Are you like sensitive about how you eat things? Oh, absolutely. I I still haven't bit like bit into an apple yet. If you get like a sandwich with like real tough bread, it's like, dude, I can't do this. Like I feel like my teeth are just gonna completely break off. <laughs> I started riding when I was. I guess I was about 12. I think I was about 95 or 96. And a good friend of mine at the time, his name was Mitch. He got a bike. His dad bought him like this old used bike. It turned out to be like an 80s Schwinn. It's always an old Schwinn, you know what I mean? Whenever it's like a, a story about an old bike. We started out building little jumps like I guess any other kid would. I remember one jump we had. It was, uh, it was like a pile of wood chips. And it uh, kind of led up into this, I guess it was a 12 by 12 piece of wood, you know, like a wooden plank. So we like built wood chips and packed them into this uh, wooden plank. And then we just jumped off it for <laughs> a long time. You know, that was, that's all we had. We didn't know what BMX was. We didn't know you could even do tricks on a bike. We were just, you know, jumping off stuff. That's all it was, you know. I don't know what had me so attached to it for so long it, without even knowing that it was a thing, you know what I mean? I had come across a catalog. It was it was like a bicycle company catalog. It was Trek. And on the back cover was a guy riding a BMX bike. And uh, he was doing a trick. I, I don't remember what the trick was, but I saw that and I was like, wow, this this is awesome. The first skate park I went to is called The Pipe in Janesville. It was almost just shocking to see like these ramps, you know, people build these to ride these bikes on. I think because of the fact that I went to a skate park at such an early age, it, it created a love for skate parks and that's still what I really enjoy riding. So I rode the pipe for a few years and then we heard about another skate park down in Rockford, Illinois. It was basically a BMX park. And uh, once we discovered that place, we started going to Rockford like every week. I remember the first time I went there, I walked in, they had these big doors, you know, like a, like a loading dock door, and they were all opened up, and I saw a guy jump. It's what it's called a box jump. He jumped in and did a 360, and uh, I just, like, my jaw just dropped. I was so, like, at that time, I was so novice, I guess, that I just, like, had never seen that. It turns out I'm still friends with that guy today. He's still here. He lives in Milwaukee, and I still talk to him from time to time. It's pretty cool. I grew up in, it's a town called Delavan. The good thing about Delavan was the location. I was literally in the middle of all the BMX scenes, like Chicago, Rockford, Milwaukee, even Madison. 
and we were like dead in the center. So it was like an hour drive to, you know, any skate park. So that was convenient uh, for us. Like I said, we were in the middle of Milwaukee and Chicago and every, each, each one of those cities obviously had their own crews and uh, we were in the middle. So we we're just like, we need something. So we had a group of probably like five or six guys that we call ourselves the uh, DWC, the Delavan, Wisconsin crew. We loved it. We started to, uh, I guess, kind of get recognized in the local areas, and we just did our own thing. We were we were the group of guys that we loved to ride BMX, but we never wanted to make it anything else. You know what I mean? We never we didn't we never really wanted to progress with it. We just like showing up and having a good time. A lot of the people in the surrounding areas, they wanted to make BMX, uh, you know what I mean, a professional career. I never wanted it to be more than just a hobby, and I'm still the same way. You know, I've been riding for, you know, almost 20 years now, and it's it's never progressed into anything more. So, something I've kind of come up with it's it, it's okay to have a passion for BMX, but don't take it too seriously. Is kind of what I live by now. I have an extreme passion for it. I think I, I think I love BMX more than a lot of other people that ride, you know, but I've, but I've never taken it seriously and it's never been more than a hobby to me, but it's also a passion and photography is, it's, it's gone along with it. You know, I, I got a camera when I was really young, just started shooting BMX. This was a long time ago. This is probably 15 years ago. So I've, I've really been shooting photos for like 15 years about, I've never progressed from it. I've never made it anything more than a hobby. I know there's possibilities to uh, to progress from them and make money off them or whatever it may be, but I just I never really wanted to. I do love accomplishment. Like you push yourself, you know, to land a certain trick. I've always been into that, but it's it's more of like on a personal level. So so I spent a lot of time writing. You know what I mean? And I I didn't spend any time doing homework or concentrating on school. I'm not depressed about it or anything like that. It's just something I wish I I could. You know, sometimes go back and do better in school and see where my life might have taken me. I was really into art and I was into painting and sketching. And uh, I still have a painting up in my high school, which is which is pretty cool. It's like a big uh, Martin Luther King portrait I did in like my junior year. What did you feel like you wanted to be more supported in? Like academically, you mean? Absolutely. I, I didn't think about that until until I joined the military. It's something I've thought about more and more as my life went on. I was immature and I was a kid riding a BMX bike. I never thought to get good grades and I wished that I had someone to motivate me to do better academically, you know, so I could I could go to a you know a traditional university, you know, and I could I could get a degree. I just wanted to be able to be pushed now that I look back. I, I just wanted someone to to be able to motivate me. I needed something. I needed I, I needed a goal that was achievable. I just needed a goal. I didn't have any real goals. You know, I rode BMX as a hobby. I did bad in school and what am I going to do after school? I don't care. You know, I'll just work a job. You know what I mean? I'm always motivated to get to the next level now, you know, when it comes to like rank and pay grade and uh, leadership, you know, and I, I'm, I have this constant motivation in front of me, you know, like now it's, it's good. I'm, I'm figuring out what I'm capable of. Do you think that when you were growing up that the whole time you were a goal-oriented person, but you just didn't know that about yourself? I just didn't know that, yeah. I, I, I think now that I look back, I could have been, and I could have done more. And I think I always had that in me, but I just didn't have anybody to bring it out. A lot of like depression runs in my family and lack of, lack of motivation. and So that's something I think about all the time too, you know, and I try to create a different life for my kids, you know, and I, I push them all the time to do better. When I decided to join the military, I kind of felt like I was at a dead end in my life. I had opened a, like a BMX shop, BMX and skateboard shop in my hometown, and I was, I was just young and immature, and I, I was spending my earnings, you know, immediately, and it didn't last. I also went to like a technical college, but I dropped out. You know, I was going for graphic design, and I was like, like at a dead end, you know. And for some reason, I, I just had this thought to look into joining the Navy. You know, I went online and I checked it out, and I got hooked like instantly. I was like, you know what? I'm doing this. 
I thought in my head, I was like, this is a way where I can really see what I can accomplish and what I can achieve. You know, I can't live in this small town forever. I need to experience new things and I need to challenge myself. It's exactly what it did, you know? As soon as I stepped foot into boot camp, I was like, yeah, this is for me. Like, people yelling at me and pushing me, you know? I wanted to shoot photos in the military. Not necessarily be like a combat photographer or anything like that. I didn't want to, you know, see war firsthand, but I wanted to shoot photos. And I was, at that time, I was really into shooting photos. So that's what my initial choice was. At the time, I guess they didn't need any photographers or, or whatever the case was. And they're like, whoa, but we can offer you this job and we can offer you this job. I was like, all right, fine. I just want to do it. I do a lot of writing, actually. It's kind of weird. I, something I never really thought I would do. Um, so I would like do a lot of award writing, correspondence, and I pretty much have a desk job, all in all. Uh, if you want to sum it up into something, it's I sit at a desk. So I joined the military in 2008, and I got married in 06, and my son was born in 07. So he was he was still very young. Obviously, as you can imagine, the hardest part was leaving them. Coincidentally, when I got to my first duty station in Norfolk, Virginia, I remember the first conversation I had with the first guy I met. He said to me, you know we're going to Iraq, right? I, I don't know. I was just so kind of shocked by that. I was like, what? Like, I, I, I had no idea I would ever have to deploy. I know I'm in the military, but with my job, I was like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, we're going to Iraq. That sucked because I joined boot camp and I was gone for two months and then I went to like a secondary school. I was gone for like another two or three months. Then I got to Norfolk and then I went to Iraq. So that was pretty tough, especially for my wife and my son at the time because they had moved from their hometown to Virginia where they didn't know anybody. And then all of a sudden I had to leave and go to Iraq. So they were all alone, you know what I mean? So yeah, that was pretty rough. As far as my job out there, I did a lot of studying. I was studying the, the aircraft that we were using out there to basically get a qualification to where I was, you know, more or less a journeyman on that aircraft. I could I could tell you anything there is to know about it. That was a that was a really good experience. It was kind of scary at times when we were, you know, getting attacked or whatever, but I, n I never thought I was going to die out there. You know what I mean? I it was it was so far into the war that it, everything was kind of calm at that time. I was scared, I was nervous, but I, I never, I, I knew I would come home safe. I, I just had a feeling I would. Uh, Robert Parker, are you there? That's affirmative. My biggest regret is not bringing my bike to Iraq. There were so many things I could have ridden there, and now, like, they do a like a tour it's called bikes over baghdad they have like a group of pro bmx riders and they travel around to the bases and they ride stuff you know it's like damn it i wish i would have brought my bike like there's so many things i could have ridden but yeah whenever i travel i'll always bring my bike like i said i was in virginia florida vermont new orleans san diego when you go to travel those places you may just be there for a couple days and so it's tough to be able to get out and ride but i always make it a point to try to to try to go ride some, you know what I mean? Casey spent four months in Iraq. He came back to Norfolk, where he continued to be stationed for the next six years. Casey had never experienced a new area for riding BMX, but he quickly found out that getting involved in the scene was not as easy as it seemed. That was, uh, that was really tough to get involved in the scene there, in, in the BMX scene there. That was, that was incredibly tough. In riding, I tried to like always unite people together, unite uh, different you know towns or crews together, and I think a lot of people weren't really having that. You know what I mean? So I always had the best intentions, but I kind of created some enemies at the time. So where I lived, it's called the Seven Cities. They're just these seven cities that are extremely close together, and they make up Hampton Roads, is what it's called. And there was a crew in like every city, but the thing about it is like. Each of the towns or the cities were so close that I'm like, why? Why are we so divided? Like, but who is this? Who is this guy coming up, coming from Wisconsin to try to tell us like how to ride and how to how to live our lives? You know what I mean? But did you know any of that going in, or it's like you had to figure all that stuff out? I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know any of that. You know what I mean? I just 
I came from my crew where we loved people and we loved we loved riding with everybody and no that's something I had to figure out on my own and I I did when people started to uh to dislike me I definitely figured it out a lot of that stuff happened over the internet comments here and there uh, you're not part of the scene blah 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 you're, you're just a military guy it's kind of ridiculous to talk about it but I don't think they realize that I'm much more into BMX than they thought a military guy would be the only crew that Casey had at the time was mainly a group of military guys they would ride at a concrete park in Norfolk the park had a deep bowl that mimicked a deep swimming pool they called themselves the Northside Bowl Crew. <laughs> it was a group of us military guys and then a couple of the locals that were not even from there, actually. It's it's real funny. This uh, A friend of mine, Colin, he's he's originally from Australia, but he works in the BMX industry, and he just relocated to Virginia Beach, so he kind of became part of our crew, even though none of us even were from there, you know? Actually, all of us are gone, except for Colin. All of us from, the, from that Northside Bowl Crew are gone, but... So we we kind of got so many kids stoked during that time, like a bunch of little kids. You know what I mean? They were they were just really really stoked on what we were doing. When I was living in Virginia, I had like a youth group that we would meet at the skate park on Saturdays. It's something I've always loved doing, just kind of pushing kids to accomplish a goal. So from what I know, they're all still shredding out there, like in the bowl. You know what I mean? So I think we kind of developed something there. I I don't know. I feel pretty good about that. I was at the skate park a couple months ago with my son, and he was with a bunch of his friends. And we were sitting on top of this ramp. I was kind of mentoring them in a way. I was just kind of pushing them to kind of see what they can achieve or what they can accomplish. And uh, I was like kind of urging them to drop in on this ramp. And it's like a nine foot ramp. It's the biggest one at the skate park. They were all scared, you know what I mean? And I was like, you know what? I'll drop in on this ramp with my eyes closed. So sure enough, I did it, and it was like the scariest thing ever, but I just felt so great, you know, and my my heart was pounding, and it just felt awesome. I was freaked out, but I knew, I knew the ramp, and I knew what I was capable of doing. That's kind of what I tried to show the kids there. Do you consider yourself an extrovert? No, no, not at all. I think I'm definitely an introvert, but when it comes time to, like, kind of mentor people and kind of push people, for some reason, when I'm on my bike, I'm more of an extrovert. I felt like it's kind of been a shield. I'm standing behind these handlebars and I can kind of say whatever I want. Have you ever considered yourself a leader? I, I think, yeah, yeah, in, in, in a bunch of different areas, I guess. Like, I, I try to be a leader at work, especially. That's all I want to do in the Navy is lead and lead and like mentor people, you know? And like, when it comes to riding, yeah, I've always thought of myself as a leader because I kind of organize a lot of things, you know what I mean? I kind of, like I said, I try to unite people and put on events, and I've always liked leading. It's like, like I said, I'm an introvert, and I've never been pushed, but maybe that, maybe that's why I try so hard now to be a leader. I like um, this picture that you put up. I don't know if it was just the other day or whatever, but it was like a corroded piece and then another piece. And you were like, oh, it's night and day or something. That's another one of my hobbies. I restore old bicycles. <laughs> That's a huge passion of mine too. And it's like, it's so tough because I, I want to do that a lot. You know, it's, it's like another one of my interests. And so I restore these old bikes, these old BMX bikes. And So that was a piece that you restored? Yeah, yeah. It really did look like brand new. Yeah, it, uh, that's just something I love doing, like taking like the rusty old bikes and just trying to make them look brand new again. Oh my God, that piece was amazing. <laughs> I was like, maybe that one is the old one and this is a brand new one that he just got in the mail. No, it's a, it's a lot of elbow grease. <laughs> I think we touched on everything. Yeah. If I could just reiterate one thing, I would just like to say to have passion for a hobby but don't take it too seriously yeah i was thinking like that your hobby is almost like it's like a craft i mean it's like something you've just been like cultivating it and cultivating it yeah it's a it's a craft that i'll never master you know so it'll just, it'll just be a lifelong love i guess
To see photos of Casey riding, as well as his documentary balance about his best friend Tyler and the balance of being a husband, father, and riding BMX, go to the Mostly Minutia Facebook page or to ColleenLindell.com. You can also follow Casey on Instagram at Casey Smithsonian. A special thank you to New Retrowave Records for letting me feature their album Timelines by Jordan F. Also, thank you to Chris Zabriskie, who also let me feature a few of his minimalist tracks. You can find all of Chris' music, as well as more albums from New Retrowave at bandcamp.com. And as always, links to these are on my site, ColleenLindell.com. Also, thank you to Ray's Indoor Bike Park, who were so hospitable and friendly. You guys never once hassled me about following my cousin with a microphone through the middle of your park. In fact, you were over the top welcoming. And for that, I thank you. And lastly, the answer was yes. When his jaw had been wired, Casey had his younger sister, Haley, put pizza in a blender and blend it for him. He said by that point, he had destroyed Ensure and was desperate. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded on location in Delavan, Milwaukee, Wisconsin.